Okay, we have about 70 uh, signed in, so we're, we're going to start. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, PowerShift and Remote Indigenous Communities, uh, which is a cross-Canada scan and analysis of diesel reduction and clean energy policies in Canada. Uh, my name is Dave Lovkin. I'm the director of the, our Renewables and Remote Communities program at the Pemin Institute. Uh, and this program is focused on supporting the leadership and transition of remote communities across Canada off of diesel and onto uh, clean energy uh, sources. Uh, I am speaking today from the southern tip of Vancouver Island and the traditional territories of the Lakwandan people, uh, which consists of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Beecher Bay First Nations. Uh, I'm just a few minutes from the beautiful ocean and the, the Salish Sea. Uh, the, this webinar is in support of a report uh, we are launching today, and we have just launched this morning, uh, that is going to track the progress, that is tracking the progress diesel reduction and clean energy policies in provinces and territories across Canada, uh, focusing specifically on remote Indigenous communities that rely on diesel fuel for power and heat. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this work uh, has, uh, has been led by my colleague uh, Dylan Hirma, a senior analyst from the Pemin Institute, and he will shortly take us through the highlights of the work. Uh, but first, we'll just do a, a quick little introduction on the Pemin Institute and some context. Um, but for those of you that do not know, the Pemin Institute is a not-for-profit environmental organization that advocates for strong, uh, effective policies to support Canada's clean energy transition. Uh, we have offices, about five offices are located across uh, Canada. Uh, the work we do and how we do it, um, three main uh, areas that we focus on are three ways we, we do our work, evidence-based, uh, fact-based uh, research and analysis uh, is, uh, is a key component to our work, as well as uh, bringing together uh, stakeholders, uh, bringing the necessary people together to collaboratively, collaboratively solve our challenges and drive towards effective policies in Canada. Um, that requires credible perspectives in today's challenging energy conversations, requiring sound perspectives and good guidance uh, in this transition. Uh, and the work we do in Pemina uh, spans several different areas, including clean energy and electrification, uh, oil and gas policy, transportation, the climate policy, energy efficiency in the built environment, as well as the work that we are doing uh, on renewables in remote communities. So over the next 45 minutes, a uh, quick agenda for today. So uh, I will be moderating today, um, go through some very quick context, and then uh, I'll pass it over to my colleague Dylan, who will take us through uh, the research that we, we did and the, the findings that we have. We are going to um, try and keep that main section, so the context, the government direction, uh, looking at utility and regulatory policy, uh, talk about some community project experiences that we're seeing on the ground, and then talk about kind of the, the, the summary of the, of the, the, uh, the uh, scan that we've done, and then get some recommendations. We're going to try and do that within, you know, the half an hour, and then we're going to have a good half an hour for questions. Uh, the way we're going to work this webinar for the, for the questions today is um, we, you can ask questions uh, in the, the GoToWebinar, there's a question uh, box where you can pose your question, uh, or you can use the, the fancy uh, functionality of raising your hand. Um, we can unmute you, and, we, and then you can go ahead and ask your question uh, in, the, uh, in the webinar. We're not going to do a global unmuting because from our experience, and, and may, maybe many of you as well, when you unmute, uh, it just becomes too noisy with a lot of background noise. So we're not going to do a global unmute. So if you do want to ask a question, uh, raise your hand, and uh, we will find you and unmute your, uh, unmute your line. Uh, next slide. So the context of this work and uh, why we decided to, to, to do this research and, and produce this, uh, this uh, jurisdictional scorecard. Um, there is uh, a lot of momentum growing, uh, especially in the past couple of years, around uh, Indigenous involvement and in Indigenous-led uh, community energy projects. Uh, just to highlight a, a few of the really good reports uh, out recently, last year, uh, Trek did a report on growing Indigenous power. Uh, 
uh, which basically was a review of indigenous involvement in the renewable energy sector in Canada. So it's a good resource uh, that captures a lot of information. Um, and a second one that I want to draw your attention to is a academic uh, policy uh, piece uh, out of the University of Waterloo last year as well in the energy policy um, realm. And it comes with some really two really good key messages. Uh, it's about a 16 page report. Uh, and it looks at the policy evolution uh, looking at Indigenous uh, clean energy projects over the past 30 years. And two of the highlights that I want to capture uh, are, are uh, as you can see them. And so next, yeah, so the next one. So the effectiveness of government gover governance process um, is, is basically identified the pressures from local governments um, indigenous government specifically aiming to participate in electricity generation and contribute to the transformation of remote community of electricity systems from utility driven to community driven. And the, the lever of influences for that transition is the existence of indigenous leadership articulating an interest in social technological change. So what we are seeing is a shift away basically from utility driven projects historically done with little consultation. Um, towards community-driven, more holistic approach where communities are taking on and developing uh, and operating their own clean energy projects in their communities. Uh, and this work is very much tied to the discussion in Canada around reconciliation, governments adopting UNDRIP, uh, Indigenous rights and title, and the need for renewed relationship and deeper engagement with Indigenous communities. So the work that we have uh, put together and the, the, the scorecard and analysis that we've done really kind of builds on the, on this kind of shift that we are seeing uh, across Canada. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dylan to take us through uh, the actual findings and some summary points of this work. Thanks, Dave, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm joining you today here from our Vancouver office which is located on unceded Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh territory. And like Dave mentioned, this, uh, this report is just adding to that body of conversation and knowledge that's uh, already out there, but looking at the progress being made across Canada through a very policy-focused lens. Um, this work is being done as part of our mandate under the Indigenous Off-Diesel Initiative, which is being delivered by Natural Resources Canada. Uh, and this is supporting 15 community champions from remote Indigenous communities across Canada on a three-year capacity building and readiness program. And so our mandate under the initiative is really to support these champions as they navigate government, utility, and regulatory policies, and to work with these groups to advance solutions that encourage those community-led clean energy and diesel reduction initiatives. So as a result, our role includes sharing examples of successful policies and practices, uh, as well as providing some critique and recommendations where appropriate. Uh, we're also plugging in um, along with a larger group through this successful 2020 Catalyst program, which is being led and delivered by the Indigenous Clean Energy Social Enterprise, and which the 15 off-diesel initiative uh, champions are participating in as the first step in that, uh, in that journey. Uh, I'd also like to highlight the a shared future research team that's involved, and they are specifically exploring reconciliation and implementation of Indigenous rights in clean energy contexts, so going much deeper into, into that question. Uh, a little bit about our methodology. So our ratings are expressed using a, a green, yellow, red stoplights color code, or in some cases by a simple check mark when only uh, we only looked at the presence or absence of an indicator. And an empty circle as well indicates that not enough information was currently available to make an objective assessment. And you can see that in the legend below there. Uh, we used a combination of primarily publicly available documentation as well as uh, some interviews with a few experts who are deeply familiar with the progress of implementation of policies in a few uh, different jurisdictions. So starting with uh, the direction that we're seeing from provincial and territorial and the federal governments, we evaluated three metrics. The first around long-term strategies and implementation support. So that includes clear and ambitious diesel reduction targets, which are often part of government climate or energy strategies. Uh, combined with the dedicated funding for project development, uh, we see all of these as critical to accelerating the transition away from diesel reliance. Uh, the second metric around incentives and or rebates 
bid programs, which are important tools for stimulating the market and driving market transformation for clean energy and energy efficiency uh, products and services. And the third metric around government commitments to reconciliation and better relationships with indigenous communities. So uh, the clean energy transition is part of a, a much larger transition towards increased self-determination, economic development, and, and energy independence. Uh, for many of those indigenous communities. And so colonial governments that have committed to advancing reconciliation objectives, uh, for example, through endorsing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, have an obligation to re-examine their existing relationships and government structures uh, impacting indigenous communities. So I wanna highlight a couple of leading examples from this report. Um, Yukon's independent power producer policy first is a great example of uh, where a progressive government policy is supporting a robust project development environment for these communities. Uh, in this case, the Yukon Energy Branch, rather than a specific utility, supports uh, these community-led projects through a well-designed IPP policy and an unsolicited proposal process for remote communities specifically. Uh, this policy sets a target of at least 50% of projects having an Indigenous ownership component and the Yukon government also specifically emphasizes uh, government to government collaboration and a lot of flexibility in the funding arrangements. Uh, turning to another example, more on the strategies and targets side, uh, BC is a good example of government leadership here, uh, having by far the most ambitious goal in the country in terms of diesel reduction targets that are specific to remote communities. Uh, this was introduced in 2019's Clean BC plan and includes a target of reducing diesel consumption 80% by 2030 in BC's 22 largest remote communities. Uh, the remote community clean energy strategy is the, kind of the implementation side of that target and has four pillows supported by uh, about $15 million of funding this year for capacity building, renewable heat, energy efficiency retrofits, and clean power. And um, just turning to some examples of jurisdictions where there's some work needed in some provinces, recent changes in government have led or might lead to rollbacks in supporting policies and programs for reducing diesel. Uh, notably, Ontario's cancellation of energy efficiency programs and cuts to the Indigenous Affairs budget as well as Alberta's repeal of the Climate Leadership Act make the environment for communities pursuing diesel reduction initiatives in those provinces more challenging. In many other provinces, there simply just isn't a great deal of detail available from the government around strategies specifically directed uh, at supporting remote Indigenous communities. And each of these situations is, is unique. For example, Saskatchewan just has one single remote Indigenous community, so policies specifically targeted to that community don't necessarily exist. Whereas in a jurisdiction like Nunavut, all of the communities are remote, but there are serious pressing issues around aging diesel infrastructure and energy security uh, that the government is attempting to address, but not yet drawing those clear connections to how clean energy can support and drive community leadership, energy security, and self-reliance. So we need to see a renewed commitment in many provinces to working with remote Indigenous communities wanting to pursue projects. And I really want to emphasize here that uh, the leading jurisdictions have a lot of good experience and a lot of lessons that can be leveraged here and, and shared across jurisdictions. And I think we need to see more of that. So moving on to the complex utility and regulatory policy world, uh, we looked at two metrics here. Uh, the first around power procurement policies. So in order for local organizations to become proponents, owners, and operators of their own energy systems, a viable market for the power they generate needs to exist. And utilities can provide this uh, through a number of policies. Uh, for example, an independent power producer or IPP policy. But if such programs are to be successful, they must be clearly documented, well administered, and sufficiently transparent to allow proponents of projects to fairly assess their costs and benefits. Uh, we also looked at the price that renewable energy is being offered and whether it's uh, meeting the avoided cost of diesel or higher. Uh, so in our definition, this includes not just the marginal cost of diesel fuel, but also the value of avoided operation and maintenance costs that are associated with reducing the time that uh, diesel generators are running. 
So over time, these rates need to evolve to include the health, social, and environmental costs of diesel use as well. But for this assessment, we're starting by focusing on progress being made to at least get up to that avoided cost rate. A couple leading examples of policy here, uh, one being the Rain Gear program, which Hydro One Remotes has in Ontario. Uh, Hydro One Remotes is the main utility responsible for providing electricity service to remote communities there. Uh, they have a, established a separate rate class and a, a well-designed IPP policy that offers a clear process for project proponents in selling power and also establishes uh, unique rates uh, for each community. Uh, as I mentioned though, and just uh, referencing uh, an infographic that we produced a few months ago, this does need to evolve to start going beyond the marginal cost and start looking at, uh, at the avoided cost in those rates. Uh, another good example uh, in Quebec, Hydro-Quebec uh, has a plan to eventually transition all the remote communities that they serve off of diesel. Uh, this began in earnest a couple years ago with uh, an RFP process that launched and was more targeted to, to private developers, but Hydro-Quebec has since shifted their strategy a little bit to prioritize projects that are led by the community rather than by the utility or external developers. And a good example of this is the Inavik Hydro project, which is a partnership between uh, the Pituvik Land Holdings Corporation, which is community owned, and Interjex Renewable Energy. It's also Canada's first partnership between an Inuit corporation and an independent power producer. Uh, there's some issues that we're seeing as common to a lot of utilities across Canada, and these include transparency and data access. So communities don't always have free and open access to their historical energy use. And this is really a critical piece of information for proponents that want to assess the viability of their projects. Um, the utility business model itself that has endured for over 100 years in North America focuses on ownership and control of assets. And this needs to evolve as the utilities role uh, in general starts to shift more towards providing grid stability, safety and reliability services, while communities and independent producers start owning and operating more of the, the generation assets. Related to this, utilities should explore how to move beyond the relatively low renewable energy penetration limits that are currently set in many jurisdictions. And this can be uh, supported by data from grid stability studies. Uh, these should ideally be done for each community because uh, each community is unique, especially as batteries start to be included in some of these hybrid systems. Uh, there's a potential to push these limits further. Uh, higher common feedback from communities that utilities aren't providing enough meaningful opportunities uh, for the communities to participate uh, substantially in the planning and development of the energy systems that's, that provide service to them. Uh, in some cases, current policy is just quite limiting uh, for a community-led project partnership, either because there's no clear pathway for the, uh, to sell power to the utility, uh, because that process is not well documented or because the rates that are offered are quite a bit below what would make a project economically viable in, in a remote setting. Uh, and finally, we just looked at some of the progress being made by, by communities as they develop projects across Canada. Um, and this is being done at basically all, all across the country. Uh, just a simple couple of metrics here. The first on whether the jurisdiction has at least one example of a fully operational community-led clean power project at a scale greater than would be covered by a net metering or microgeneration policy. Uh, we did focus on power for this assessment, but again, want to acknowledge that there is a lot of renewable heating initiatives happening in these communities as well. And that's an area for future work for us. Uh, the second metric, uh, just looking at if there was at least one community-led clean power project in kind of the advanced development stages as uh, so with a minimum of a full feasibility study or detailed engineering design work having taken place. There are a lot of examples that, that I could highlight and I would love to, uh, to look at more of them, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to highlight a couple. Uh, one up in the Yukon, the Vantikwichin First Nations $6.5 million solar PV and battery storage microgrid project in Old Crow, 
uh, which is expected to displace around a quarter of the diesel use in the community. So the community is going to own and operate the 940 kilowatts of solar panels, while the local utility, Atco Electric, uh, is the partner and will be responsible for operating the battery storage system and uh, the overall operation of the microgrid. Over in Alberta, uh, Canada's largest remote solar PV project is being developed by Three Nations Energy. This is a collaboration um, between Fort Chippewan's Métis Local 125, the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, and the Miccosu Cree First Nation. Uh, when it's completed, it will consist of two and a half megawatts of solar and one and a half megawatt hours of battery storage, which is enough to displace 25% of diesel used in this large community in Northern Alberta. So this is just a, an overall snapshot of the provincial and territorial progress reports and the federal government progress report based on the metrics I just walked through. I'm not going to dive deeply into this assessment today just due to time, but I wanna highlight some key takeaways from this summary. Uh, there's there's relatively few standout jurisdictions, so there's there's work to be done uh, all across the country by both provincial, territorial governments and utilities and regulators as well. There's some uh, some clear leadership on government policy direction coming from the federal government, uh, BC, Quebec, as well as the Yukon. Uh, we do need to see renewed efforts from governments around uh, strategies, supporting programs, and importantly, acknowledging uh, and supporting leadership from Indigenous communities in many other provinces. Uh, utility leadership is particularly uh, evident uh, in places including Ontario, Quebec, and Yukon, and other utilities can definitely learn from these examples. These include, as I mentioned, Hydro One's clear and specific uh, IPP policy, Reindeer, Atco Electric Yukon's pioneering work on offering uh, avoided cost rates for uh, projects, and Hydro Quebec's practice of open data access and their uh, new approach to prioritizing community led partnerships. It's important to note that despite an uneven approach across provinces and territories, almost every single jurisdiction in Canada has remote community-led projects in development. Uh, many of them have projects in operation, and this really speaks to the growing momentum and capacity of remote Indigenous communities to develop uh, effective projects, forge effective partnerships, and, and really move the, the dial on clean energy and diesel reduction. So I just wanna close with, uh, with a few recommendations from the report, um, starting with policies and practices. So firstly, uh, provincial, territorial, and indigenous governments should work collaboratively to develop ambitious targets and strategies for transitioning communities to clean energy. Uh, utilities should take a harmonized approach in moving towards those consistent, open, and well-documented power procurement policies that ideally give first priority to community-led projects and, uh, and partnerships with a community ownership component. Uh, regulators should, should work with the utilities and communities to explore uh, new rate structures, uh, new utility business models that start to reward utilities for their role and it's an important role for ensuring grid stability and safety rather than simply for ownership of assets and sales of power. Uh, on the data side, utilities should be freely providing historical energy consumption and load profile data to the communities that request them. Uh, the limits for integrating intermittent renewable energy, as I mentioned, uh, should be being determined on an ongoing and on a community community by community basis, uh, backed by solid grid stability studies. On the capacity building side, uh, we'd like to see successful examples of policies, programs, and partnerships transferred uh, between jurisdictions through open dialogue and sharing of lessons learned. Uh, governments must begin to shift their policies, practices, and their engagement with Indigenous communities as part of their wider commitments and, in many cases, legal obligations to reconciliation objectives. And this includes supporting Indigenous-led capacity building initiatives and advancing opportunities for community self-determination. And finally, on the, the business case and financial side, uh, clean energy projects in these communities should be offered a rate that, at a minimum, starts to consider the avoided operation and maintenance costs on the diesel generation equipment, if those exist, 
uh, diesel subsidies, and, and this is a complex issue that we won't have time to get deeply into today, but uh, diesel subsidies should be fully accounted for to provide a fair cost comparison of diesel versus clean energy. And those subsidies should be redirected where possible to encourage the development of clean energy. And finally, funding and financing should be provided to proponents that clearly demonstrate partnership and meaningful engagement with Indigenous communities, or ideally to community organizations themselves. And we're starting to see more and more of that direction. Uh, so that's a, a quick summary of what's contained in this report. I uh, encourage you to, to check it out and read it and to get a lot more depth on each jurisdiction. But uh, with the time we have left, we're happy to uh, answer some questions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it back to Dave here. Okay. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, so um, as I said, two ways to ask. Uh, questions or you know even provide some commentary uh, through your go to webinar uh, menu you can uh, just ask a question right in the question uh, box uh, there's a couple that have come up already uh, or if you'd like to verbally ask your question or make a comment uh, to the whole webinar you can raise your hand so that is in the I believe it's on the attendee, or it might even be as, as, a, as a quick uh, quick link on kind of the side of the main box. There's a little hand. If you press that, uh, we can unmute your unmute your line, and then you can uh, you can you can speak then. So we have uh, just gone through uh, quite quickly uh, a lot of detail. Uh, again, the report is is a 60 page uh, report um, diving. Uh, deeply into the, and the methodology for each metric that we covered, as well as uh, province and territory, you know, by province and territory, looking specifically at each of those of those areas and, and, you know, referencing both public information and information that's available, as well as um, kind of our own uh, analysis and thoughts to how provinces and territories are uh, supporting Indigenous-led projects. So with that, and then, and then our recommendations on, on what we need to do to advance this. So with that, does um, anyone have any questions specifically about the, the, the research, the analysis, or does anybody have any uh, comments that they'd like to make? I have a couple questions um, in the question box. Uh, I'm going to first go with with hands. If anybody wants to to ask a question, I will go that route first. Uh, it's always good to hear people's voices. So I do not see any hands. So I have a question from uh, question from Sean on avoided cost of diesel. Uh, so I will just uh, read it quickly, uh, and then maybe Dylan can comment. Uh, so the avoided cost of diesel is quite high, and renewable should be com uh, competitive or lower in many cases. Why do you define clean energy valuation at the diesel cost as positive? If renewables are cheaper, lower valuation would help drive down electricity costs and put a dent in critical energy poverty issues in many communities. There's some subsidization complications to this, but it is hard to argue lower supply costs would be wouldn't be positive for the community. Uh, Dylan, do you want to uh, take a crack at that? Um, thanks for the question, Sean. And uh, definitely agree that it's a it's a critical consideration for for most utilities as as well as for the communities and the governance in the communities not to be. Uh, having electricity rates rising. Um, I think that um, the uh, marginal cost of diesel, so just the cost of basically producing one more kilowatt hour from the generator, and that, that basically includes the cost of getting the fuel there and, and whatever the efficiency of the generator is. In a lot of communities, particularly in the north or where there's fly-in access only, um, the rate of that electricity generation is not necessarily high enough yet uh, to support the integration of renewables, uh, particularly if you're trying to make the business case for integrating some storage. Um, we know that construction costs and, uh, and operation costs are higher in remote communities as well. Um, 
what we also know is that you know the way that utilities recover costs includes um, rec recovering the operation and maintenance costs on the diesel side, and that includes planning for uh, capital uh, refurbishment or replacement of those generators. It also includes things like uh, routine maintenance, belt and oil changes, and things like that on the diesel side. So if, if the project is well designed and well integrated and it is as of a sufficient size that it's going to substantially reduce uh, the maintenance costs on that diesel generation, uh, th those are costs that, um, that cost savings that are being passed on through rates, you know, that the utility is allowed to recover the costs from their maintenance uh, side. So if they're reducing those costs, that should um, that should lower the rates. So I think that there, there's a there's a there's a pathway to offering the avoided cost without raising electricity rates um, overall. And a, a good example of that being done in in the Yukon in a couple of projects um, so far. Okay, thanks, Dylan. Uh, I'm going to go to a capacity question. So this is from Travis Jones. Um, can we comment on what the findings were relating to the capacity challenges that exist at the community level and how those may be approached? So I think that's a great connection, kind of bringing bringing our work uh, as well as the uh, the ICE, uh, the Indigenous Clean Energy, and the Off Diesel Initiative uh, together to to tackle some of these issues. Dylan, do you want to comment further on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's there's definitely you know capacity challenges in in these communities very very isolated uh, really small populations and so there's a there's a lot of competing priorities for for time and capacity for sure um, so this is is basically part of the the mandate of the the program that we're involved in and that we're supporting through this work the indigenous off diesel initiative. Uh, which is, you know, one of several capacity building efforts that exist and and that there's funding for across Canada, but this one kind of uh, specifically designed to to take a, a cohort of energy champions from communities through a, a supported three-year journey, um, connecting them with resources and mentors and um, providing um, some some relatively uh, untied uh, funding that that allows them to do things like um, like turn these these clean energy champion roles into full time uh, full time positions um, things like that and and one of the the best things that I can highlight on building capacity at the community level um, is this first step of the program which being delivered by the Indigenous Clean Energy uh, Social Enterprise and the 2020 Catalyst Program. So this is a, a program that's in its fourth year now and every year is taking around 20 uh, energy champions from communities um, basically through uh, three, three intensive sessions a week long uh, as well as kind of ongoing support um, and, and access to a body of alumni and mentors um, that's really um, providing an excellent background in uh, basically everything that you need to start thinking about uh, developing uh, and getting a clean energy project off the ground. And um, this program, we've seen it be really successful and, and we're seeing this kind of this community and, and resource um, grow around that program and around other capacity building programs that there's really now a, a good opportunity to uh, uh, for, for these new um, incoming Catalysts and champions to access to this really active network of, of folks that are developing projects that have the experience and that are that are doing a lot of sharing um, of expertise and lessons and there's a lot of momentum there. And I see that there's <clears throat> there's a few uh, participants in the off diesel initiative actually on the on the webinar. I'm not sure if. If uh, anybody wants to to make some comments, but we're this this off diesel initiative is is just in its first year, so it's a, a three year uh, program. So this uh, initiative and this uh, co collaboration between Enercan, uh, the Indigenous Clean Energy Social Enterprise, Pemin Institute, and Shared Future uh, will be an excellent um, uh, way to to see the the changes that we can we can look at through. 
uh, not only supporting uh, capacity building uh, and leadership in Indigenous communities, but in parallel, you know, supporting good policy change to uh, to support that Indigenous leadership. Uh, I do see your hand up, Doug. I will get to you shortly. I'm going to go through a few more questions. Uh, one uh, really good one from Cornelius. Um, on the whole utility model, so the question is, if utilities allow for third-party power being uh, fed into the grid, into the microgrid, um, question of who should pay for the reduced uh, revenue the utility will have? Uh, it's a tough question. Um, uh, Dylan, any thoughts from you on that and in terms of utility reform? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. and. Um, you know, I think in the in the short term, uh, we need we need to start by looking at, you know, what are the full costs being recovered by the utility, and, and how can we start to make sure that we're accounting for all of those and passing all of those savings along, you know, without reducing a lot of revenue for the utility. There's also the the question of, of subsidies and how those can be redirected. But I think that the the long term question is really relevant. Um, and, and applies not just to, to remote communities and not, not just to the Canadian context, but actually to the, the utility business model um, across North America and across the world, um, that as generation becomes more decentralized and, and as there's sort of more of a movement towards um, local, local community groups and independent uh, producers, producing more of that energy, producing more intermittent energy, uh, we, I think that it's really important to look into that question of regulatory and utility business model reform and, and see if the, the regulatory compact can be revisited so that we're looking at kind of the, the critical services that utilities uh, are providing and that, and that likely will still provide for a lot of years to come in many communities. And, and those are, you know, more around the providing grid stability, safety, reliability, um, operation of the, the microgrid, um, in a lot of cases, operating the storage systems and man managing the intermittency is something that, that utilities, I think, can and should be um, more directly rewarded for in their, in their rate uh, structures, rather than just looking at their rate base and how much power uh, sales are, are going on. Um, so that's not, not a, a, an issue that's going to be changed or solved overnight. That's a big systems change question, but um, I think it, it's, it's good to recognize the, the unique position that uh, remote and remote indigenous communities are in um, both, both in their vulnerability in terms of energy security and, and not having the reliance on the North American grid as, as backup, um, but also their, you know, generally the communities that are going to be the hit hardest by changing climate as energy security becomes more threatened, as, as ice road seasons become shorter, as airlifts into a fuel become more challenging. Um, it's a really good place to start looking at you know, where these reforms need to be made and, and how we can start making these energy systems more resilient um, with, with the, the support and the input and the participation of the community. So, Great. Thanks, Dylan. Yeah, and we, uh, we do have a blog on utility business models. If you go to our uh, PEMIN website and, and find our Renewables and Remote Communities page, um, or uh, look for blogs uh, from Dylan. There's there's a good uh, blog that goes into that a little more detail. Uh, okay, uh, Doug, let's go to you. Hopefully, my magical unmuting will work. So to Doug Fife to um, talk about some of his experiences that he's working in uh, remote communities in Northern Ontario. So Doug, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good morning and afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah, I'd just like to spend uh, about a minute discussing a feasibility study I carried out about three years ago at the remote community in Northern Ontario for energy independence, basically for the remote community, and it was a First Nation remote community for their ownership, management, operation and maintenance, so complete uh, ownership of, of the system. Um, it was initial for a PV solar farm, wind could be included as well. 
but it also included various energy storage options such as lithium ion or lead acid battery, mass flywheel uh, pump storage, uh, liquid air, hydrogen fuel cell and even compressed air and also met weather monitoring because in that feasibility study which was funded by Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada by the way, um, a weather monitoring system to prepare for a smart microgrid management system for example voltage support so if it was nice and bright and sunny and the power was flowing then big black clouds were coming over uh, the system could be prepped to uh, have the, the batteries ready or whatever the control method would be so that voltage support would be available instantly and it also covered um, if there's going to be a renewable energy diesel mix to optimize diesel generation so getting the most amount of power from the diesel generator for the amount of fuel used in any surplus to demand could be stored in one of the um, energy storage methods. So this report uh, I completed just over three years ago uh, in conjunction with the First Nation collaboration with them and it coincided with the end of me doing project managing for the University of Waterloo, an Eco Energy 2 project in the same First Nation community. So I just want to let you know that uh, there's great options out there and the feasibility study that I did uh, covers quite a bit. I'm sure it could cover more if more work wanted to be done, but uh, it, um, it is there and uh, I think it's a model that could be used as a, if, if nothing else, other than a baseline to start to give so complete energy independence for remote communities, First Nation or otherwise. Okay, thanks, thanks, Doug. And and just quickly, what was the what is the community's involvement or leadership in in that project? You you did a pre feasibility for them. Where are they in, in terms of wanting to move forward with some of those options? Yep, it's the Casabonica Lake First Nation, uh, quite far north in Ontario, um, and between. Casabonica Lake and Indigenous Northern Affairs Canada. I got a lot of support from the First Nations Band Council and some band members. Uh, that feasibility study was carried out, uh, basically to give them energy independence. Uh, someone earlier mentioned that a lot of the diesel has to be flown in by air tanker. Um, mm -hmm. And with poor winter road conditions, you know, they sometimes can't get diesel in by winter road. It's always got to be flown in by air. So again, trying to get over to full renewable energy uh, seems sensible. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Doug. Okay, we're going to go back to a question. So Julian Lafay, uh is has a question about uh, penetration levels. So the question is about diesel displacement objectives. The projects you've mentioned displaced uh, only around 25% of diesel, uh, and that includes uh, battery storage as well in, in that system. Uh, are you aware of a roadmap to displacing the remaining 75%? Uh, is it even possible with current technologies? Uh, if so, what timelines are we looking at? So a question of, of you know, 25% is, is great, but how do we uh, get communities onto a 100% diesel uh, displacement uh, pathway? Yeah, great question, um, and, and I think important to to point that out and and just acknowledge the that there in in most communities there is still a role for that you know that baseload generation whatever it looks like and and this transition is not going to happen uh, in o overnight or even in a year. Um, there are a, a few projects that are being have been developed or are being developed in remote communities. That have displaced, you know, 75% or even 100% of, of diesel use. Um, a couple examples of that um, would be Pesquita First Nation uh, on the west coast of Vancouver Island, which is uh, developing a small hydro project that will displace over 75% of their diesel use. Um, you know, there are a, a couple of other communities that have managed to basically completely transition over and keep their diesel generations just for backup purposes. Um, that's generally a function of uh, what the local renewable resource available is in these communities. And, you know, it's 
probably no surprise, this being a cross Canada scan, that there's an incredible diversity of resources available to different communities. Um, in some of these uh, communities and areas with more access to hydropower, so remote communities on the, the west coast of British Columbia, um, and a number of communities um, in northern Quebec that have that potential to, to have that baseload hydropower and go completely off diesel. Um, there's also good opportunities for, for baseload biomass energy uh, in a lot of communities that have access to biomass and uh, seeing some, some projects coming up there in, in Manitoba, some existing projects in the Northwest Territories. Um, as far as the, the, the further north and, and the, the really remote communities in, in places like Nunavut, definitely a challenge. Uh, you know, there's, there's good solar resource in the summer, there's good wind resource year round in a lot of those communities, but um, yeah, addressing the, the question of, of seasonal storage uh, is going to be a big one going forward. I think that there's a lot of a lot of good progress that can be made in the meantime, but but in the long run, the the longer term roadmap I think is is probably more towards you know seasonal storage by for gasification or or hydrogen or whatever it ends up being. So definitely a, a long a long road to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions, any verbal questions anybody wants to ask? I'd love to hear some some voices on the phone or the computer. Uh, anybody willing to uh, raise their hand and ask some questions or make some comments? Uh, we have a hand up from Max Declaguerre. De so Max, I am going to unmute your line and Hear from you, Max. Can you can yes, you hear hello. us or can you speak? Hello, Great. do you hear me? Go ahead, Max. Yes, yes uh, we can. Well, uh, I have uh, two quick questions. The first one: uh, Do you favor solar or wind uh, energy in the, the project? Which one do you prefer, or is there a uh, is it situational? How how do you determine which to choose? Uh, yeah, I think it's it's completely context dependent, completely situational. Um, you know it. Totally depends on what the resource is in the community. Um, the the sort of current wave of projects that that we're seeing a lot of a lot of progress and a lot of development right now. Um, a lot of it is solar uh, or solar combined with battery storage, uh, just because that's a, a really good way of of starting to displace uh, the use of diesel. Kind of you know in that in that neighborhood of 25, 30, 40 percent. Um, I think you're seeing more wind projects um, in development and in feasibility right now. Uh, I think that will definitely play a more important role um, in the coming years, for, you know, particularly in those communities that have good resource. Um, a lot of communities in, in Nunavut have excellent wind resource. So I'd say currently we're seeing more, more development on the solar PV and battery side, but I think that definitely will require a mix of resources in the long term. And, and there are more wind projects um, definitely in, in development at this point. Okay, and my second quick question is uh, for the Old Crow and the Fort Chippewan, uh, you mentioned a one-fourth reduction in diesel. Uh, does that count heating or is that just for electricity production? Uh, that is just for electricity production, uh, I believe, for both of those projects. So um, the, the use of diesel heating oil for heating is, uh, is a huge part of the diesel use and a huge part of the, the GHG footprint uh, as well. And, and that's definitely uh, an issue that we didn't talk as much about today, but um, is also a, a critical part of this transition, starting with energy efficiency, uh, in in homes and buildings, and and eventually looking towards renewable heating solutions is 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 a, also a monumental task. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Yeah, and the the difference between power and heat is it's a very interesting situation, specifically in remote communities where uh, much much and all the or, or all of the power generation is regulated, um, and utilities are regulated to provide that power. Uh, where heating for the majority of the situations is not a regulated industry. Um, some communities do have district uh, energy system, but it's it's not provided by a regulated utility. 
so the the work under this off diesel initiative where we have started even though this uh this report card is is focusing on power you know we did kind of do a scan and look at um, programs available for energy efficiency and heating um but it's always it's 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 interesting and, and somewhat easier to start at the the regulated side because you know that's where the levers are to make to have influence to influence policy to uh to shift um power generation to clean energy and indigenous led uh, we will start tackling the heating side next and start you know thinking through what actually has to happen on a policy side to support uh, clean energy transition on the heating side, whether you know demand side management, energy efficiency to reduce that load, or uh, renewable energy technologies like uh, like bioenergy. Uh, I am going to go to Callie Churchill. Uh, Callie, I have unmuted your line. Go ahead. Hi, it's actually uh, uh, Jason Clark here. There's a there's a group of us from from GHD that have. Uh, joined on on the webinar so thank you for the okay. opportunity to uh, ask the question um, yeah I just wanted to um, inquire about um, funding related to greenhouse gas programs in uh, in Canada uh, this seems sort of like a prime opportunity for the federal government to you know allocate greenhouse gas um, you know funding through through their federal program to projects uh, such as this, not to mention there's there's greenhouse gas protocols written in Alberta um, um, for projects like this. Um, so I was just wondering kind of what what uh, role that that greenhouse gas market is going to play with the, the further development of these projects, as well as kind of the ongoing financial support through the generation of, uh, of greenhouse gas credits. Uh, um, excellent question. And uh, I guess specifically looking at um, at setting up projects that are used to to produce GHG credits um, isn't something that uh, that we've looked at in depth. That it'd be an interesting an interesting uh, area for future research for sure. Um, there's there's definitely funding available that is tied you know specifically to GHG programming and GHG reductions. You know, you know not just to to diesel reduction, but that we have funding programs like the the low carbon economy challenge and um, and and sort of those those climate related funding programs that are available to communities and municipalities across Canada, a lot of those programs being provided by the by the federal government. Um, but yeah, I think there's there's definitely some opportunities for that if that's something that the, the community and the, and the community partnership wants to pursue to, to kind of look at whether it supports the they can integrate that to support the business case for their projects. Um, there's also some some good just uh, just local um, local economic development and activity happening ar around um, activities that, that do produce GHG offsets, like the, um, the biomass uh, heating initiatives that are being uh, developed in, in Manitoba are looking at setting up uh, basically a, a local economy for, for producing that biomass feedstock from, from local uh, beetle kill and fire kill um, areas. And so there's there's definitely a, a carbon, a carbon biomass and, and carbon sequestration uh, benefit there potentially. But as far as looking at um, certified GHG credits, it's not something that that we looked at in the scope of this. Uh, but a, a great flag for uh, for a future area. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jason. Uh, okay, we just have about five uh, minutes left. I think we'll we'll just reserve uh, a couple minutes just to 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 kind of reiterate the summary and and the findings and and where we, where we're going to go next with this work through the off diesel initiative. Uh, one question, uh, actually, I'll combine two questions. Uh, question is is driven by uh, question from Felix uh, McCure. Uh, he says, I understand that this report is focused on domestic clean energy policies, but I'm curious if Pemina has been looking at other countries with favorable policies to support indigenous clean energy projects. Are there lessons learned that Canada can uh, learn from? Uh, and then a, a follow-on question from J.P. Pinard uh, asking if we studied the Alaska success stories of the Shininik uh, Wind Group. So um, 
question on, you know, where outside Canada is uh, is there is there leadership in in policy development around clean energy indigenous led projects? Mm -hmm. Excellent question, and uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, JP and uh, and Felix a, a great great flag uh, to look at what's being done in, in Alaska with uh, with their indigenous led projects and their their co-op models. Uh, it is something that, that we've looked at from a, a policy perspective, uh, kind of as a, a first look at how those how those co-ops have been set up and how their their project development process has, has unfolded over the last few years. Um, we, we do have some uh, some follow up, some deeper engagement plan with uh, with some of those folks in Alaska to to, to look at uh, what the success factors were there. So that's definitely the the closest closest example, and there's for sure. Uh, for sure, some lessons that can be transferred there. Um, on the on the technical side, we also you know looked at um, the the progress being made just at at microgrids and the and the research being done in general as to to what are the, the you know the current feasibility limits for how much renewables uh, how many how much intermittent renewable capacity we can integrate into these communities while still maintaining stability on a smaller microgrid. And there's there's a lot of excellent research that, that's being done on uh, remote islands, remote island uh, communities in the in the South Pacific, in the Caribbean, um, even places like Hawaii that have you know relatively small grids. So some some excellent technical research being done there that, that I think supports the the kind of mandate of of having robust grid stability studies being done for these these microgrids because uh, in some cases they can actually support you know pretty robust amount of, of intermittents uh, but on the policy side um, you know I think there's there's good policy examples in Alaska and, and as well just kind of the, the, all of the the Arctic Council uh, nations you know looking at the, those unique challenges of remote and northern communities so looking at um, yeah, all of the Arctic Council countries as well. Okay, thanks, Dylan. Uh, I'm just going to end with uh, one last question. I don't think it's a question that we can uh, answer on this uh, this webinar, but I but I always think it's it's good to to hear these questions that people are asking. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to get too many other hand ups or questions. Um, but to, to kind of end it, just in terms of, of what other people are thinking, this question is from Yuho Okada, uh, and the question is, if the government uh, put these reserve systems in place, meaning uh, First Nation reserves, and is committed to following through with energy improvements under UNDRIP and the, and the reconciliation call to actions, why does it seem so difficult to get away from the inefficient energy situation created on reserves today? Uh, so just a question of, you know, what is that commitment to reconciliation, uh, specifically looking at the the energy situation in uh, remote First Nations and, and other Indigenous communities, uh, and how do we actually, you know, strive towards that uh, that energy independence that uh, that many are articulating desire for? Uh, Dylan, any any thought, you know final thoughts from you on that? Yeah. Um... Uh, it definitely, this is a this is a really really important side of this conversation and and a huge a huge topic for for conversation. Um, I think that there's uh, there's a lot of work to be done just in in the sense of governments in, in the first place. You know, in terms of committing to reconciliation frameworks like like UNDRIP and the TRC calls to action. Um, you know, we we have kind of an intention. From a couple of provinces, but really, you know, very few jurisdictions that actually have legislation that that kind of directly requires that 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 laws and and by by extension practices and policies are actually brought into into harmony with with those reconciliation principles. So, you know, we we had some some examples of potential legislative movements um, uh, around Bill C two sixty two federally. Um, BC has an intention to to adopt UNDRIP into legislation and, and require that laws are brought into harmony with it. Uh, you know, Manitoba has its uh, Path to Reconciliation Act. So I think that uh, definitely need to see more more uh, commitment from governments on uh, you know accountability and, and legislative frameworks um, to to sort of put some teeth behind the the, the commitments and the adoption of, of UNDRIP. Um, and if this is just a, 
a a, a huge uh, reframing and rethinking that needs to happen. And uh, but there, there's I just want to you know stress that there's a lot of benefits for for both the communities and for the the colonial governments. You know, advancing these opportunities for for indigenous communities to to meet their goals of, of independence and self-reliance and help the, these governments and utilities honor their commitments to reconciliation. Um, we, we also know that projects in indigenous communities that prioritize, you know, authentic relationships and partnerships and demonstrate that really strong support from the community are much more likely to be successful projects in the long run. So, you know, it, it makes sense and it follows that policy should be evolving to, to drive and support these kinds of projects. So. Uh, great question, not a question with an easy answer, but um, you know, I think that, that, that there's a lot of progress that can be made and needs to be made. Yeah, and I think that really speaks to the the mandate of the Off Diesel Initiative and the involvement of of all the groups uh, that are collaborating with uh, Natural Resources Canada on this. Um, and even from the initial interaction we're having with the Off Diesel Initiative participants through the 2020 Catalyst Program, you know, that is coming up loud and clear that, you know, there needs to be a drive towards reconciliation, you know, legal obligations, as well as other uh, concepts and topics that we've heard about, you know, co-op models. There's, there's been some expression uh, stated about um, getting into and, and looking at different ways that we can uh, um, support uh, different business models and, and different ways to develop these projects. We are over time. Just want to respect uh, everybody's uh, time commitment to this. So thank you very much for everybody joining. Um, there are our email addresses uh, if you want to follow up. Um, with any questions, uh, the remaining questions we will that we didn't uh, answer, we will uh, try and follow up with you personally. Um, look for more information coming as we uh, continue on this journey with uh, Natural Resources Canada and uh, the Indigenous Clean Energy Social Enterprise around supporting uh, good energy policy in remote communities. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your time. Thank you.